this is a busy plot, but it is a very important plot. Uh, it is published by uh, NREL or the National uh, Renewable Energy uh, Laboratory and it is updated uh, whenever there is a new data point on it. So, they do not update it periodically or anything, but whenever there is a new data point they do published out a new one. So, this is taken out from today. So, this is all the data points uh, as of today and uh, each point on this plot essentially uh, represents a story and if it is a line with you know uh, a lot of consecutive names it represents either a company or a you know a major program uh, at a university. For example, this uh, at Stanford represents the uh, the back contact cell that was developed uh, over here which forms sun power. Then all these laboratory cells from UNSW, it is a university in uh, South Wales in Australia. It is all driven by one guy called uh, Martin Green who has been uh, driving all this work uh, over there. So, what we covered in the class uh, on uh, uh, Monday was essentially this blue part of the curve which uh, corresponds to uh, crystalline uh, silicon uh, solar cells. What I want to cover today is this bottom of the curve that is uh, what corresponds to uh, thin film uh, solar cells. And uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, stuff going on over here, but before we get to that let me just summarize what we uh, studied on Monday. So, we study that you know all these uh, uh, high tech uh, technologies they fall in price as exponential uh, of function of how much capacity or how much experience you gain and that was given by this experience parameter and that experience parameter is depends upon how mature that technology is. So, something like uh, wind turbine the price relatively stays constant the exponential is very low. Uh, the for uh, for uh, photovoltaic the experience parameter is uh, 0.29. So, the equivalent of Moore's law in, in this field is this is a term which you know is, is, is popularized by this website uh, green tech media they call this demi Moore's law because uh, Moore's law is the experience parameter of you know the price at least used to fall as uh, twice half of every two years. So, experience parameter was somewhere between uh, 0 0.5 to 0 0.6. Solar is, is half of that. So, besides the axis it is the demi in French stands for half. So, half of Moore's law is, uh, is what the price at solar fall there. That is a good way to remember it if, <coughs> if that helps uh, in uh, you know memorizing how the price of solar falls. So, just to recap you know if you uh, live around here if you go outside of Stanford and walk around you know any of the streets around Palo Alto a lot of the houses you will see uh, have solar panels on top because one of the reason is that Palo Alto has a smart grid where you can feed in directly into the grid. So, you will see you know vans like this parked on the street and people installing solar panels. So, looking at just looking at the panels you can tell a lot about this. For example, looking at this panel and looking at the cell, so it looks like this right. So, in most of the single crystalline installations in, in US as of today are uh, from uh, these three big uh, companies and these are all uh, companies uh, based in China, Yingli, uh, Suntech, Trina. Yingli was one of the only Chinese company which was sponsoring uh, Olympic. And you can see most of the US installations for crystalline solar cells come from these, uh, uh, these uh, companies. And similarly if you go especially towards you know walk around the streets around uh, University Avenue you will find a lot of panels like this. They look, they look uh, you know more black than the other ones. If you uh, zoom in and look at each of these individual panels they look like this. So, these are you know the way you can tell these are sun power cells are these are first of all crystalline. So, these are you know octahedrons that is characteristic of crystalline. And 
this is in 12, but there's nothing on the top. So all the contacts are on the back, that's the interdigited uh, back cell. And the only company which sells these kind of cells is, is SunPower. They invented it over here and then commercialized it. And these are typically much higher efficiencies than what you get from you know other uh, other front contact based uh, cells that most of these Chinese suppliers sell. So these have efficiency module efficiency of around uh, up of twenty uh, percent. And by you know just looking at it, by if you look at somebody's roof, you can tell whether it's uh, where that cell where that cell came from, right? Um, uh, especially for rooftop installations, you know, go around uh, University Avenue, uh, go beyond Waverly and take, you know, a few blocks right on any of these streets. You'll find a few of these cells on, on uh, roofs of uh, people's homes. <coughs> now, looking at this, this is something that we want to study today. So looking at this, who made this? So there are a few distinct things about these these one as compared to other, right? These are much bigger. They uh, they look single pieces of glass, and uh, so that is the topic we want to cover today. So these are uh, thin film uh, based panels, and they look very different. So they look huge panels. They look like single panels, uh, and. Uh, You'll find a few of these if you take the uh, Oregon Expressway exit on 101. You'll see a lot of these on the side. So next time you're driving around, my, the point I want to drive home is pay some attention and try to notice where they. You can pretty much pinpoint who the supplier is 90% of the cases by uh, just looking at the panel and looking at the how it's arranged. So this is a big installation of those kind of panels, and these are uh, panels made by uh, First Solar. That's the company which makes uh, cattle-based uh, uh, thin film solar cells, and a lot of utility-based farms. You, these solar farms is where m mostly you'll find these cells. These are not as high efficiency as single crystalline, so they are not uh, as prevalent in rooftops. But a lot of times on you know. Um, uh, either in these utility scales or these uh, uh, on the sides of 101, you'll notice uh, a lot of these panels. So this is what I want to cover today. So today is about uh, thin film uh, solar. So I want to cover a few basics uh, of uh, thin film uh, technology, and del delve into four main variants of it, where uh, most of the action is amorphous silicon. Uh, cadmium terylide, uh, SIGs based cells, and organic PV. And then, you know, try to identify some common issues with uh, all uh, four. So, <coughs> the selling point of all these thin film uh, crystalline cell is, you know, it could be summarized by this equation that your dollar per watt at peak intensity, and peak intensity is given by that thousand watt per meter square. It's just your uh, the ratio of your cost divided by efficiency. So if you have higher efficiency, you can tolerate uh, higher cost. But uh, these thin films, their selling point is that they have low efficiency, but they come with a much lower cost. So you know they have um, even though they have lower efficiency, uh, you have uh, you uh, play on the cost, and then each of these. Thin film technology, they also have a roadmap for efficiency. So that's, that's how they claim that they can uh, reduce their dollar per watt going forward. So one of the main uh, cost reductions comes from the point that you don't have any crystalline silicon, so neither do you have to cut those wafers or cast those multicrystalline uh, cubes uh, from which you cut wafers. These are typically much thinner. They can be made uh, flexible. They are large panels. All of these things result in uh, lowering of your uh, balance of system or your install cost. Also, these are you know typically grown in just a few steps, so they have less number of layers. That means less number of steps. Again, means uh, less cost. So to understand a little bit about uh, these thin film technologies, all of them are made of amorphous silicon, uh, um, amorphous materials. 
So the point we need to you know drive home is why what's the origin of band gap in amorphous material? So typically when you have a crystalline solid, you'll have these if you you know if you measure their bonds, they'll fall essentially in very discrete lines, and you'll have all these very discrete spacings, whichever way you measure in a 3D crystalline. On a gas, for example, there's no regular order, so there's no band gap. Uh, amorphous material, they have a variation in these, uh, in these different uh, bond lengths and bond angles. A more, uh, uh, a more formal term to understand is what's called a continuous random network. And it's, you know, two opposite uh, uh, terms, continuous and random. But what it means is that you have, you can have same uh, uh, location between near, your nearest neighbor, but uh, you could still have a random order. So it's not possible in 1D arrangement of atoms. If you have 1D arrangement of atoms, you can't have, you know, continuous as well as random at the same time. But it is possible in, in 3D structure. So this is shown over here. So all, all of these, what these uh, figures represent is that each of your silicon in each of these random networks is still bonded to four nearest neighbors. And uh, between its nearest neighbor, like for each of these uh, silicon atoms, it still has, you know, a bond length in the neighborhood of 3.5. And the angle of these bonds also is very close to what you get in ideal tetrahedron and only varies by 10 degrees. So on local level, you have this order, but on a, on a large scale, it's still random. That's why most of these amorphous materials have band gap to start with. And what it leads to is you'll have um, these, uh, again, uh, it's a, I'm describing silicon here, so you'll have a sp3 quantization, and you'll still get these uh, bonding and antibonding states, which will give you your uh, conduction and valence band. But because of that random order, you'll get these localized states beyond your band gap, and you'll also get these uh, defects uh, in your band gap. So this is another way to understand the same thing. So these are, this is the wave function in amorphous material so you will have this is your actual wave function but you can still represent it because of that continuous random num uh, network as an envelope plus these uh, uh, you know perturbations around that envelope so that envelope results in this uh, in these conduction and valence band as you see in a crystalline uh, material but because of that random perturbations you get these stale states and you also get these defect states uh, in the middle. And this is, you know, a mix, this is a, a blessing in disguise as well as, you know, one of the main problems uh, with amorphous uh, uh, material. So your density of states, if you uh, plot it, it's uh, like, uh, it's represented by this uh, a square root relationship as you will get uh, in a 3D crystal beyond this uh, particular level, but there still exists a density of states within the band gap, and plotted here is that density of state in a linear scale, and it essentially falls off uh, exponentially as you move away from these, uh, from these uh, band edges. Uh, and this is uh, plotting the same thing in a log scale, so you see that you have that square root relationship beyond the band edges, but then you get this uh, linear looking uh, tail, uh, because it's plotted in the log scale now. And then you also get these uh, defect states uh, in the middle. And these defect state states, uh, uh, they are because a bond was missing, and these are typically amphoteric in nature, so they could either uh, hold an electron, they could hold a hole, or they could be neutral. And that requires a lot of new physics to bring in. There's a different physics for recombination generation. Uh, so it requires a paradigm shift uh, in terms of uh, how we think about these materials. So things like EK diagrams that you typically associate with crystalline materials, 
those are no longer valid. There's no concept of uh, direct or indirect uh, band gap. You know, your K uh, space uh, preservation rule is no longer valid. You, uh, you still have, you know, a density of states, but uh, effective mass is no longer valid because which point do you take the curvature? You have this continuous tail of things. So because of these tail states, also your resulting mobility is much lower in amorphous silicon. Amorph any amorphous material, and all you need to, you know, uh, invent all these new uh, terms to describe your uh, transport. Also, doping these materials is, is not uh, easy as well. That's why most of these cells they make use of a heterostructure to make these uh, contacts. 